Pat, it's June. We're doing no, yes, there's is. nostalgia like nostalgia. And strangely enough, sort of a version of late screening because the film we're talking about today, incredibly, neither of us have seen in the 50 years right. it's been out. And that is, of course, yes. Enter the Dragon, starring the late, great Bruce Lee. How you doing, Pat? Great. And uh, yes, I, and the reason I haven't seen it is because I simply am not a huge martial arts film fan, but I wow. am so intrigued with Bruce Lee as a as a uh, entity, his early death, and now going over his filmography and research for this. I'm I'm a Lee fan now. I, I have to say, <laughs> and and you know we we're seeing his ultimate film. This is this was going to make him the superstar that he always craved to be. And somehow that wasn't to be. And it's, it's weird because, you know, uh, some 20, almost 20 years later, a similar fate would befall his son, Brandon on the set of the crow, mm. um, you know, sudden death, so weird cusp of superstardom, uh, insanely charismatic uh, performers, both of them. Um, but I want to, I want to go back a second I can't I can't right. rush by this, Pat. How are you not a fan of martial arts movies? <laughs> <laughs> it was very difficult in those days because that was the thing. But I had no idea in the movie culture of where I grew up. I don't I don't think that was a thing. I I mean, did Enter the Dragon play at the Marquette Cinema in Michigan City? I I don't know. You know, you could, because we have no press or internet or, you know, nobody really covered this stuff, right? So if you didn't know a movie was coming out, a few weeks later, you wouldn't even know it existed in the, in the, in the cinema. Uh, yeah, which is, I, th there is something to be said for that. I know, but, well, you know, back in the era that we're talking about, movies unlike today they would run for a long time now granted yes those were if they were you know particularly smash hits right but i mean from what i know right. of enter the dragon it cost i think three hundred and eighty-five thousand to make and grossed like eight hundred thousand eight hundred thousand eight, oh eight hundred yes right and it grossed yeah. i think four hundred million <laughs> yes worldwide, which is insane <laughs> one of the most profitable films of all time so could you imagine being a, a like a hundred thousand dollar investor? Maybe you're like a, a car dealer. And you say, Oh, my brother wants me to put a hundred thousand in this film. Suddenly you're you're in a big mansion, you don't have to do anything. <laughs> well, and this would definitely be the film to invest in because not only it, it's one of those films that I feel more than earns its reputation, because yeah. I was not familiar with Bruce Lee. I, I think I'd seen a couple episodes of the Green Hornet. I was aware okay. that Tarant I, I remember Tarantino had a scene with him in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, you know, fighting Brad Pitt, which was very controversial. With his family. Right. Yeah. But as far as watching him in action in the context of a full film, right. I'd never seen it. And and my wife and I, we watched it last night together. And the opening mm -hmm. scene where he's kind of doing that, uh, he's in the the Shaolin uh, temple, just kind of fighting the guy, they're exercising, they're sparring. She says, my right. God, his muscles have muscles. <laughs> <laughs> he I mean, was cut, look, baby. <laughs> he was. There's not an ounce of fat on him. Magnificent. <laughs> and he moves so so gracefully. It's, it's, oh. it's really incredible. Um, well, one but, of the things I found out about him in his early training is that he won the National Hong Kong Cha-Cha Contest. So he knew movement. He knew dance. His, his invention of his particular martial art was the style of all styles, right? It was like, let us take everything about martial arts and put it into a form that is more fluid, more inventive, more creative. I mean, the guy, for his 32 years on Earth, had a huge influence on our culture. And, you know, I mean, somebody rando on the street wouldn't understand, but once you start saying, do you like action movies? Do you like the cha-cha? You know, the, suddenly they're warming up. <laughs> yeah, and 
it's also Enter the Dragon. I'd heard about it, obviously, because it's a very famous and very influential movie, right. which we'll talk about in a bit. But I thought it was just going to because it's about a guy who kind of goes undercover to it, be involved in a tournament run by a crime lord. I expected it to right. be more like what the Mortal Kombat movies ended up being, where it's 90 minutes ah. of just people fighting other people, fighting other people, and you work your way up the ladder <laughs> like a video game boss thing. But this is this is mostly a spy movie. <laughs> well, also I read that Mortal Kombat ripped off the plot of oh. Iron the Dragon. Oh, so definitely. there you go. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Mortal Kombat, the, uh, uh, like tons of movies and comics and stuff. I mean, I feel like the, if this wasn't the progenitor of those cliches, it was probably I would say it's the most influential. Um, oh God, yes. Yeah. God, yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, the one thing I will say about um, the plot of the it, plot stiff. Let's let's put it out. I thought the plot was a little stiff, but I will say that Lee. You know, this was this was Lee's film. If you read the background, he he pretty much argued every day on the set about this film, but. Um, he wanted to keep the the confrontations part of the drama or the confrontations are part of the drama there's not a, a preponderance of fighting scenes like for example i saw the transformers movie first half pretty good second half all fighting boring as shit as far as i'm concerned you know <laughs> so so if you if you put the fights as part of the drama as something larger that's what makes that mirror thing at the end just so spectacular. It's something larger. It's something, it's anti-colonialism. You know, the, there's obvious uh, shots at the Brits in this thing. Um, I mean, he was a deep, deep thinker. And he he also knew how drama worked, even in Chop Saki movies. So. Well, also that there's different forms of fighting and winning. There's that great scene where all the people who are gathered from around the world, I mean, it's a small group of people, but they're on a boat going to this mysterious <laughs> island uh, owned by right. Han, and they're all kind of sizing each other up. And there's this guy who was, I can't remember if he was from Norway or the Netherlands or whatever, but he was this big guy who wanted to challenge uh, Bruce Lee's character, who was also named Mr. Lee. Uh, and he's, I can't remember the exact line but he said something like you know i'm gonna fight you and you won't even know it or it's the I, fight the fighting of no fighting the fighting of no fighting and he right. basically just like says, the style no style right but he says okay how are we gonna do this and bruce lee <laughs> says okay there's that there's that island we're gonna take this boat this smaller boat off the big boat we're gonna go over there and fight he lets the big guy go first and he basically lets him hang out there for the rest of the journey, tethered by a rope to the big boat. And he's just sitting there laughing like, see, I won. <laughs> but I didn't have to throw, yeah. a, throw a, yeah. a fist. It's it's smart and it's also charming. And you're also like, oh, my God, that's brilliant. The guy's defeated. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, there's a process in the film that that takes the arc of the character, not only through the fighting and the, and the spy thing, but the... Um, you know, is he going to stay uh, true to his own self if he's, you know, uh, expressing the fight of no fight philosophy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so, again, uh, you know, he, he, used, he, he copied the Orson Welles mirror scene from the lady from Shanghai. But when you're talking about conflict, it's a different thing. If you're talking about fighting, it's a different thing. And it approaches, you know, Mr. Lee's philosophy of the entire film, fight with no fight. And uh, mere, if, if, if you're reflected, if you're seeing your self-image, who are you fighting with anyway? So, yeah. And also the very idea well of, yeah. And also the idea of um, the literal, the, the metaphorical becomes literal because his, Right. master at the beginning at the temple is telling him you you know in order to face your enemy you have to tr strip down their illusions because that's pretty much all they have and then you strike and at the end he gets through this mirror maze with han by 
cracking, you know, punching holes in the mirrors so that the reflections aren't right. imperfect. He can see who's really coming at him. Right. It's 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 kind of hokey, but it also works partially because it's filmed so well. I don't know where the hell they put that camera, but it didn't show uh, up. And uh, like, it seemed like every angle was a reflection without a camera there. It felt like I was in that maze it's, with it. It's, it's tremendously well done. I, I, uh, I, I put that right up there with the lady from Shanghai, that scene. Have you seen lady from Shanghai? No, I, I didn't know it was an Orson yeah. Welles film. Did Orson he direct Welles it or film. Just, did he start it? He, 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 he directed and started it. The, the story is apocryphal, but he supposedly, he, Somebody called, one of the studio uh, execs called him and said, Austin, we have to get your next movie. We have to have it in next summer. What are you going to do? And he saw that his secretary was reading a book called Lady from Shanghai. So he said, my next film is Lady from Shanghai. And he went and wrote the script and the rest is film history. <laughs> Rita Hayworth, his wife at the time, is in it as a blonde. Yowza. I got. I got to find this movie. Maybe maybe we should oh, talk about it someday. <laughs> I'd love to. Um, but okay, so I I still got to go back to this. You don't like, or you didn't. You have not appreciated martial arts movies. Have there been martial well, arts movies you've connected with, or is this kind of the no, first sure. time you're like, wow, it struck lightning, and now you're more interested in seeing what else is out there? When I was a kid, there was a station, a, a UHF station that showed them constantly. Okay. So a lot of my friends got into it, but I would watch it and it, it bored me because most of them were just fights. Mm. So if you want to talk about martial arts, I go to Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon, which had this amazing, you know, uh, a fantastical mystical plot as well as these uh, intense fight scenes that seem to come out of some sort of uh, magical realism. So yeah, that, that, that stuff is great. I just need a plot. And Aaron the Dragon had a great plot. Great, even though it was stiff, <laughs> I, I bought it. Uh, and I also saw what, what uh, the, the filmmakers and Bruce Lee were, were, was doing in it. And they followed through to the very end. It was beautiful as the helicopters are coming in, you know, spoiler alert. <laughs> yes, there are, there are helicopters at the end of Enter the Dragon. Sorry if that ruins the movie for you. Um, <laughs> well, <laughs> we didn't say who's flying um, them or what they're doing. Um, but, but hey, real quick, um, because yeah. if you haven't seen these, I can highly recommend them. These are the two movies that got me I, I'm still not as familiar with martial arts movies, but they're the first two movies that made me appreciate what can be done in the area of martial arts. And they're both by right. Stephen Chow. They are Shaolin Soccer and Kung Fu Hustle. Have you seen these? Now, is, is Kung Fu Hustle, is that the one that's sort of a satire? It is. There are satirical elements to it. I would say it's more of a like a genre comedy. Um, okay. But it's also a serious, it's a funny but serious action movie, <laughs> if that makes oh, any okay. sense. No, no. Yeah. I, I, I think I'm mixing it up with something else. But what was the other title? Uh, Shaolin Soccer. Yeah, both by the same by the same I, guy, Stephen Chow. I think I've heard of both of these. Well, definitely I've heard of Kung Fu Hustle. Yeah. But um, before we get off the Brandon um, uh, Bruce Lee connection, I have to say, interestingly enough, both of them were fake shemped. Do you know the term fake shemp? I do, and I can't remember what it means. <laughs> well, Shemp Howard of the Three Stooges, who took over for Curly, mm -hmm. um, dies of a heart attack on the street. Well, there's, I guess, three Stooges shorts in production. They're about three quarters of the way through them. So they put a fake Shemp in. They, they have a, you know, they give him a wig. They show the back of his head. Larry and Mo handle a lot of the scenes and Shemp's upstairs and that sort of thing. So anyway, this fake Shemp becomes a term in the business. So Bruce Lee was fake, fake Shemp on his next movie, uh, which they finish without him. They use a stuntman in it. And then, um, then Brandon, of course, was fake Shemp in, uh, in The Crow after he was killed. So 
And I know what's your um, theory. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. No, I was just going to ask you, what's your theory on the triads taking them out? The Hong Kong uh, gangsters, they had a curse in their family or something. I don't know if I've actually heard that. I mean, oh, wow. <laughs> my question would be why? I mean, <laughs> I, I'm trying to figure out <laughs> what, well, what would, why would anyone have a grudge against Bruce Lee and Brandon Lee unless they actually think these guys are trying to destroy international crime syndicates? Maybe they were and all for it. Well, I think uh, Bruce Lee's uh, interaction with the triads owned a lot of the film industry in Hong Kong. Mm. And I think he butted heads with them in his early career as it was taking off. And then he got more popular than them. And of course, went to America, Warner Brothers, for Air of the Dragon. So I think there was a lot of bad blood there. And, but w whether it whether it came came down to Brandon, I don't know. I mean, that would be, that's keeping the grudge too long. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I mean, the well, man's he, been dead 30 years. Let the kid have a break. <laughs> well, but you know, that also goes back to the classic villain thing. I mean, you can look at General Zod from Superman. When uh, Jor-El puts him on trial, he's like, I'm going to come for you and I'm going to come for your heirs and I'm never going to stop coming for your family. Right. Who knows? Maybe the triads were big right. Superman fans, but that would have been before that. <laughs> Um, yeah. How about no, uh, how about the guy Lalo Schifrin who wrote the Miss Mission Impossible theme? What a soundtrack! It was great. It was like, I I love everything about this movie. the The score, the costuming, the production design. I mean, yeah. it's it's just so crazy because you have got these fighters who go over to this island and they all have their kind of luxury suites. And you've got uh, Williams played by Jim Kelly, who's got like, <laughs> uh, you know, the, the revolutionary posters and like the black power fist. And it's like he made the he made this palatial dorm into like <laughs> his, his own little headquarters. Um, we haven't even talked great. about uh, we haven't talked about John Saxon yet. Um <laughs> I look. He was a '70s. He was a, a quintessential '70s character guy. Uh, he killed me, man. That that guy. He, he he's you know he's just one of those. He's chiseled out of stone. <laughs> Here's he's the thing. one of those guys that looks like a bust of himself. You know. I know he looks like he looks like the Mort Drucker caricature of himself, if there was one. Right, right. right? There you go. Perfect. Bring in the Drucker rule. Yeah. <laughs> but here's the thing: yeah, I, I only knew John Saxon from really from A Nightmare on Elm Street, where he played you know ah, Nancy's dad, the the cop. Sure. Because I grew up watching that movie, and years ago, like ten or fifteen years ago, I actually met him at a at a horror convention. Had him sign my Elm Street really. Poster. Yeah, if if I had known that he was in Enter the Dragon and that he was this awesome in Enter the Dragon, I would have said, screw oh. the Elm Street poster. I got to get something else. On yeah, this. <laughs> dude, exactly. And I, it was like Fred Williamson, Fred the Hammer Williamson. I've only met him once. But that dude was everywhere in the 70s. I only asked him about MASH, where he played Spear Chucker Jones. I'm like, <laughs> why didn't I ask him about black exploitation? Why never, you know, him and Jim Kelly did a film together. How about his? Wow, he was just amazing. What did they? What movie were they in together? Kelly was in, huh? What movie were they in? Oh, together? It wasn't Black Belt Jones? <laughs> black Belt Jones was Jim Kelly's character. Uh, give me a second. I, I have his. I have the page up. Uh, but. <laughs> But I mean, here's the thing, and it, it really is a shame that Bruce Lee passed away for many different reasons. But I'm watching this movie thinking, this is kind of like the Fast and the Furious franchise 30 years before that was even a thing. Because uh -huh. it's essentially like these people are doing one very specific thing. These are martial artists. The Fast and the Furious people mm -hmm. are just like car street racers. But they become international spies trying to you know take down world corruption. These people just have this insane chemistry. And even though it's not people fighting each other for 90 minutes, I was so wrapped <laughs> up in their spy caper and their little backstories, backstories yeah. that just yeah. the, let's talk about the editing techniques. 
that boat scene that I mentioned earlier, we get the backstory of, you know, how each of these right. three figures came to be on that boat. Right. And they dissolve in and out with this perfectly fluid water that every time we come back, we're almost on the water of the boat. It looks like, nice. you know, early CGI before that was even a dream in someone's head. <laughs> well, the, the, the director was found by Lee because he had directed a fight scene in a mainstream film or not mainstream, but a, a familiar film from the 70s. And I can't remember the name of it, but he was impressed by the way he handled a fight scene. So he wanted his eye on the fight scene, even though they fought constantly on set. Um, Jim Kelly was in a film called Three the Hard Way, <laughs> which is a great title. Three the Hard Way with Jim Brown and Fred the Hammer Williamson. <laughs> that that almost sounds like an adult feature there, Pat. Three the Hard Way starring <laughs> Fred the Hammer Williamson. <laughs> uh, I'm waiting for the OnlyFans remake of that. Um... <laughs> Very good, sir. <laughs> but uh you can't no, get I mean, much you can't get much leverage with a porn joke but that one was good <laughs> thank you um but no but no so like john saxon's character and this is this is another thing that got me just as a film critic his uh -huh. name his last his name's roper and so every time <laughs> come someone on, would knock address on my him, door Right. No, I was thinking I was thinking of Richard Roper, the film critic. Oh, <laughs> I was thinking of Mr. Roper from Three's Company. You imagine John Saxon as Mr. Hilarious. Roper from Three's Company. And uh, oh, my God, why can't I think of his name? Barney Fife. What was his, who's the actor? Who's the actor who played uh, Mr. Roper? Don Mr. Knotts. Mr. Furley. Don, yeah. Don Furley. Knotts played oh. Mr. Furley. It was oh, Norman. Right. Uh, Fell Norman Fell, Mr. Yes. Roper. Okay, yeah. so let's swap. We've got Norman Fell in Enter the Dragon and John Saxon in, in The Ropers. <laughs> I'm trying yeah. to find what I remember. I think I remember Saxon more from TV. Okay. Uh, you know, he did a lot of TV. I'm saying, yeah, The Rookies, Police Story, Banachek. He even did a Mary Tyler Moore show. I mean, he did a lot of stuff. That's where I remember from. Well, the thing anyway, that's really go on. Saxon well, is is like a golfer, or not a golfer, but a gambler, right? Yeah, we we meet him on the golf course, and it's so funny because in a regular movie, <laughs> this would be two different scenes where he's golfing, and then he gets confronted by the the mobsters that he's in debt to. But no, he's golfing. The ball goes way off into the woods. He goes to get it, and randomly, there's these three mob heavies there saying, "Where's one hundred seventy-five thousand dollars?" Hilarious! <laughs> and they just they walk just back out, out of the nowhere. golf course, <laughs> right? But then he just strolls back. And he's like, he's he asks his girlfriend or his secretary, whoever. He's like, "How much money do I have in the bank?" She's like, sixty-three dollars and eighty cents." He's like, "Well, it's all yours. I'm going to I'm going I to said, mysterious island." Only a white man in the seventies can travel with only having sixty three in the bank. <laughs> well, here's my question because he also gets into some gambling on that boat, and if, if I knew those just, numbers right, he was in for way more than he had in his pocket. Yeah, he shells out this fat wad of cash. I'm like, what's going on here, guys? Yeah, yeah, I know. There. Well, I like also liked. I was really particularly taken with his golf partner in that scene. I looked him up. His name is Alan Kent, but, but he was just, he would look like he had a big toupee on. He was sort of look like the skipper from Gilligan's Island. I'm like, wow. <laughs> All right. So let's, what was it? Alan Hale was on Gilligan's Island. So we'll swap him for yeah. Alan Kent and then see what happened. No, right. um... <laughs> it would have been great if Alan Hale had made that cameo. Uh, then the film would have been legend. <laughs> It's already legendary, but it's yes, legend. even, even, it is even legend. more legendary. But yeah, so you've got what I appreciated. And this is another thing I was kicking myself because, well, I could probably look it up online, but you know, I would love to have asked John Saxon, like how much of that martial arts fighting was you? Because he does oh, his good was. deal of fighting. There is some of it in, you know, it's kind of extreme close up, so you can tell, well, he's taking a punch, but you know, it could just be the angle of it. But there are some sh shots where it looked like he was actually, you know, kicking and punching and flipping people. It didn't look like he had a black belt karate. 
Yeah, he had black belt. It was the reason that he was cast. Wow. That, yeah. Perfect. I mean, that, I love this movie yeah. even more exactly. now. <laughs> exactly. Well, Jim Kelly was a, a, a last second substitute. And what, it, he ran a martial arts studio in L.A. that a lot of the celebrities uh, went to. So when the original actor dropped out, you know, the director was sitting there and Bruce Lee knew of him. So he blew in a call to him. He was on the set or, you know, maybe two weeks before production. He was there learning his lines and he was absolutely perfect. I don't, I can't imagine someone else in the role. That's how good he was. He was yeah, amazing. At first, I thought it was Link from the Mod Squad. When you see him like walking, ah. you know, to the boat and everything, I'm like, is that fucking Link? But no, um, <laughs> he had the Link, a, a, the Link a hair. Definitely. I was going to say Afro, but maybe a, that's politically incorrect to say. You know, it was an Afro. Um, <laughs> but no, going back to the production design and the costuming, I don't know if this yeah. is just sheer coincidence, but that scene we we're talking about where he's walking through the city to get to the boat he's in this tremendous mm -hmm. like dark red suit like head to toe even even his afro is sort of has tinges of red in it it's probably the lighting or the sun mm -hmm. or something but i noticed mm -hmm. that the the street and the buildings also had this red tinge so it becomes almost this perfect monochromatic sequence as you're following this character yeah. that you're wondering who this is and is that the beginning of the movie where he's crossing yes. the street in, in hong kong yeah. Yeah, and there's another thing. There's there, there, well, there's different like visual touches like that all throughout right. the movie that you wonder how much of that is happy accidents versus how much of it was conceived right. of like we're going to make every inch of this kind of like the Spider Verse movies is going to be art. Right, right, and uh, one of the things that shocked me was the confrontation with the police scene. First off, it was it was crazy, crazy direct. That's a nice term for it. And secondly, man, he just he kicked the man's ass and then stole the, <laughs> the cop man car. was down <laughs> and then stole the cop car because he needed a ride to the airport. <laughs> he just he just pulled up to the curb of the airport, left the keys and the visor, and just went in and flew to Hong Kong. <laughs> Oh, God bless Jim Kelly. I, you know, there's a popular footballer named Jim Kelly, but he was a white quarterback. So when when I saw the name Jim Kelly, I'm thinking, oh, Jim Kelly, the football player, but that's Jim Brown, the fo you know, all that crazy. Williamson also played in the NFL. So, um, uh, yeah, I, the, I was I was surprised, too, um, because, you know, when we're watching these older movies that are of a time, and we see the, you know, overt <laughs> racism in it. It is, it's weird because I grew up watching movies like this. You know, this sort of predated my exposure to, to right. different films. But I was used to seeing more like charged, risque, edgy material in movies. But in the last, you know, couple of decades, a lot of that's been kind of winnowed out by what you might call political correctness or whatever. So now right. when I'm watching something, I'm like, oh, now... I hope, and it's not that I need to see the racism preserved in movies, but I, you probably heard what happened with the French Connection recently. I did. I did. Um, I just read I that hope, today. I hope they don't touch Enter the Dragon because no. as awful as that scene is, it just have makes the scene. victory over the cops that much sweeter. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Um, the... Isn't isn't Roper the horniest martial arts man? And he's like like Kirk going to another planet. Uh, not quite, because well, he was I know he about was, Jim Kelly. Well, right, but here's the Go thing: ahead. like Roper, he at least had that kind of monogamous flair because he fell for um, what was the I don't know who the uh, who yeah. the woman was it Tanya. Anna Capri. I'm, I can't see a picture, but I'm just imagining that was her name. But the blonde, yeah. uh, kind of the overseer right. of the of the palace, he zeroes in on her from the first time he sees her at that kind of the the opening right. reception to she shows up with this group of girls said, here, take your pick. And he's like, I don't want them. I want you. And they become a thing. Um, but I will right. say uh, Jim uh, Kelly's no, Williams. OK. So I was right. Um, but Jim yeah. Kelly's uh, 
Williams character during what I'll call the uh, I was going to call it the whore montage, but these are probably sex slaves. So that's really demeaning. And I don't want to you know get in. Oh, I, I don't really want to demean them. Yeah. But yeah. So basically, Tanya brings to each of our contestants a group of women to say, here, take your pick. And William says, I'll yeah. take you and you and you. I would take you and you, but I'm trying to preserve my energy or something like that. I'm like, wow. <laughs> oh, it was so bad. But and then there's a scene funny. where she's walking on his back and then it cuts to Kelly with several, several uh, women at his disposal. They, they couldn't hire women to play prostitutes so they hired real prostitutes to be the women in the uh I, I kid you not that was one of the facts on imdb why couldn't they hire women to play prostitutes was that a regulation people, or they just couldn't find anyone to say yeah I'll they do said this. the production had trouble finding actresses to play prostitutes and perform nude so they hired real life prostitutes a prominent in the chinese 1970s <laughs> It's, it was a different culture. Okay. Um, there's, there's a little footnote to it. A prominent Chinese producer not related to the film commented after the movie was released, he couldn't understand that because he felt all Chinese actress, actresses were basically prostitutes who would do anything for a role. So, wow. <laughs> I know. I was like, what? <laughs> Oi. Uh, Back That's crazy, in, huh? In the era of saying what you mean, I guess. But now here, here's yeah. the thing, though. One of the things I really liked about where this movie goes is, you know, Han, the the big boss man, uh, played by Ken Shi, if I have that right. Um, he was a sort of a corrupt member of the same Shaolin temple that Lee comes from. And that's one of the right. reasons he's called upon to infiltrate this, this group because he knows the, the culture and the principles that he'd be kind of going up against. Um, right. But at one point Han uh, fights Williams uh, to the death and Williams goes like crashing. He gets his ass handed to him and he goes crashing yep. through this wall into the sort of the, I guess I'll call it the green room for a lot of these, you know, women that are on well, the island. And as they're getting, I called as he's it the getting, set. Hmm? I called it the set of laughing. But go on, <laughs> it would well, look like the set of laughing. Yeah, and all the the crazy paint paintings yeah. on the wall <laughs> yeah. and stuff. But yeah, yeah. what struck me about this is, in the earlier scenes where these women are being offered up to the contestants, they're very kind of reserve they're they're smiling seductively right they're playing a part but in this moment when he comes crashing through the wall a lot of them are sitting there like laughing at him as he's having the crap beaten out of him almost as, right. as if like oh these are our off hours we hate you and everything that you and your you know colleagues stand for we're just gonna sit here and watch our boss you know you know beat you to death even though, as has been uh, speculated earlier on, those women tend to not last very long in the presence of Mr. Han either. So it's a very interesting yeah. dynamic, especially at the end when we see what happens to Williams. I thought he was, right. well, he, he did die, but we see his body later. Very striking yeah. image of him being held above water, right. completely encased right. in chains. Now, yep. they could have had him bound up any other way. Yep. And I haven't done any reading yep. on this, but I felt like that was a very deliberate, symbolic choice. Oh, I would say so. And also, um, uh, death became so cheap in this film. Mm -hmm. I was like, it's a bad day to be a henchman for Han. <laughs> you hope your, hope your insurance is paid up because Mr. Lee is coming to kick your butt and kill you. Like, there was a sequence where Bruce Lee, like, snapped the necks of about five guys in a row and just piled up the bodies. I'm like, oh, that's good family entertainment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but there was also the um I think it was I think it was was it Bolo who was the big like the big Arnold like the Chinese Arnold Schwarzenegger looking dude in that they had basically the same <laughs> physique as Arnold did back in the seventies. Um right. who was he's the the real big enforcer. There was a couple of big enforcers, but this was the main, I think, dude. But when he got into it with Lee and with basically anybody, it was 
I was scared. Like I, I had my doubts about if anyone was going to be able to survive against this guy. <laughs> well, he's the, um, you know, they always, that's a, that's a movie thing where they bring out the big guy to do the fight. Like in Butch Cassidy, where he goes, uh, okay, on the count of three, we'll, we'll start the fight. One, two, and on two, he kicks him in the balls. <laughs> well, and right, that but, was uh, Jaws. That was Paul Newman oh, and Jaws. Was that Butch Cassidy? Yeah, that was Butch Cassidy. Well, so, the thing about so They always bring out the big guy, you know, in Heartbreak Ridge, they bring out the Swede to take on Clint Eastwood. <laughs> and he right. gets his ass handed to him. So. But the the thing about this is they do a little bit of build up before the confrontation with Lee to kind of demonstrate who this guy is and what his role is, because and and, and to illustrate how ruthless Han is as a criminal mastermind. The night before, uh, Lee had gone on a reconnaissance mission to find out. It turns out Han has been running drugs out of the basement layer of his palace or whatever. He goes to do some yeah. investigating, some like rope climbing and stuff. Um and the next day, Han basically gathers everybody and says, look, we know one of you left your rooms in the compound, which is forbidden. And I'm not going to punish you, but I am going to punish the the five guards that let it happen. And so he brings out this guy, these guys, and then he brings out his giant enforcer <laughs> dude who mercilessly kills them. Like they give it their best, I but they're no match for him. And the one guy tries to get away, but then the crowd of other henchmen force him back into the arena. It's so it's sad yeah. and it's brutal too. <laughs> even even when Bruce Lee climbs a rope, he is a perfect muscle. You know, he does it with his legs up. I don't think it's possible to do that. I would last one ring and then my <laughs> legs would go down and I'd fall to the earth dead. He, he becomes he becomes one with the rope as, as he you know, does. Yeah. And also the, the well, giant um, snake that he puts in the in the bag that uh, it was a nice surprise for the people in the control room. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's talk about the term. This time it's personal because this time it was personal. Now, is that cliche gotten to the point where virtually every movie is this time it's personal because. I don't know what, what film recently I was saying that. Like I was saying that there's too much this time it's personal. I don't know if it was Fast X or one of the I, I was gonna or... I was gonna say it sounds like a Fast X thing. Like this time it's about family <laughs> and it's personal. Um yeah. but but no But is that I'm... cliche such that every movie is like that and we have to just stop saying it? Well, I think yes, we should stop saying it because it is a cliche. <laughs> But I will say, Enter the Dragon, and I, it's a 50-year-old example, so maybe it's one of the first times that this was really a big thing. But the whole personal motivation, I think, is brilliantly handled because in an early flashback, we find out that Han's goons were responsible for, in a way, the death of Lee's sister. Right. Like she's yep. walking around town with, was it her uncle or father or somebody these guys who are basically on leave, they decide to harass the pretty girl. There's this great chase. She really gives it, you know, gives as good as she gets. But when she's cornered in this, you know, warehouse by these guys who are going to do horrible things to her, she takes a piece of shattered glass. And we've seen people do this before. Like, I'm going to kill you before you kill me. But I haven't right. seen the point of view from the glass before like the camera is yeah. her hands on either side grabbing the shard and pulling it in towards the stomach i'm like this is chilling and this is the yeah. first like 15 really minutes well of the done. movie yeah and that was uh han's greatest fighter too who ultimately cornered her and was going to take care of her and then rather than confront or be defeated by him she kills herself and how how um how it got back to Mr. Lee, I'll have no idea. <laughs> but that's that was his motivation when he was fighting that dude. Well, I think I think it was because the older the older gentleman that was with her, I don't know if that was the dad or just an old family friend, but he told he told ah, him that right, story because right, he right. went to see him in the beginning. But I loved it that when they're talking about uh it's the I'll call him the CIA bird, MI6, the liaison, Mr. Braithwaite, is kind of briefing <laughs> Lee on his mission. 
he said he's showing him like the one photograph we have of Han, and then this is the one piece of video we have of the main henchman as he's like breaking bricks that are on fire and shit. And he says he's got this scar in his face, and no one knows how he got it. I love that it's not a big mystery you know, for another like three minutes because almost immediately we're in the flashback where we see that the sister gave him that scar. <laughs> Well, also, the film that is shown to Mr. Lee is beautifully produced. <laughs> yeah. Cutaways and, and close-ups. It, is... it started with it started with the freeze frame of Mr. Han and his henchmen, and then it went into this glorious black and white summary of his crimes. <laughs> I and it, loved it. It did it did feel like it was like a very modern like montage and like different angles and close-ups and stuff like right. who's filming this <laughs> this right, super exactly. secret it society of killers <laughs> who are also good cinematographers <laughs> um, I, I wrote down the film on Han strangely specific <laughs> <laughs> how about um, the party let's talk about the party scene um, when they first get to the island mm, now mm -hmm. My, in my association work with the Asian pop of cinema, I'm always looking for how they project the culture, you know? And to me, that scene, scene seemed to be a little <clears throat> Americanized version of what that particular scene would be like, rather than, because Bruce Lee's thing was we have to bring in an Asian sensibility to these films. We have to honor China or Hong Kong through these films. And yet I did feel that that was a strangely, almost stereotypical scene. What was your take on that? Stereotypical in terms of the way the Chinese are portrayed? In terms or... of how it was set up and, you know, they had the dragon going through and you know, it was just a bizarrely, like almost Charlie Chan type scene. If, if, if that's another way of putting it. Whereas it's, it's, it's a it's a scene of Asian culture through the lens of an Americanized view, meaning that there's going to be stereotypes. There's going to be, you know, the compliant servants, the women, the, the dragon puppet. I don't well, know. Well, here, here's the thing. It didn't and, and strike this is, you that way. I, I'm, I'm... <laughs> it, but it didn't right. not strike me that way. And I've I've okay. had this question in a number of recent movies and I can't name them because I'm, you know, very tired. But there are movies that dealt with what I'll say are older movies that dealt with race issues and race portrayals in ways that people have perceived as being insensitive. And my question is, how much of that is true in terms of being intentionally insensitive versus right. people who thought that they were perhaps rep you know, be representing different cultures in a positive light? that may to the people of those cultures be offensive, you know, <laughs> because right. we're, we're talking about pre-internet <laughs> era, but, yeah. but, but we're talking pre-internet era. We're talking about, yeah. you know, if you happen yeah. to know someone from that culture, maybe they could clue you in, but if you had to make your best guess, <laughs> dot, dot, dot. My question in regards to enter the dragon though, two points. One, right. if Bruce Lee One. was so, micromanagey and i don't mean that in a negative way but if he was so right. involved in every detail of the production it's entirely possible that what we saw was him coordinating a an authentic representation of chinese culture maybe it's a melange like oh my god they've got the dragons and the servants and the girls maybe that's <laughs> just like you're gonna put everything into this you know party which kind of ties into my second point which is if it was a, a stereotype and a cliche, perhaps it could be on the part of Han, who understands the perception of Asian culture among Westerners and wants right. to put on right. the best yes. version of that to entice people to say, oh, you like you like dancing girls? You like dragons? We right. got dragons. We can show you some of those. <laughs> it doesn't matter the reality I mean, is what I'm saying. He's putting on a show for the Americans and the Brits or whatever. At first, I was going to say you're going deep, but... That that makes perfect sense because they have two Americans coming to the island, and you know, both of them probably have not been to Hong Kong before. Maybe they have. I don't know. But but you're absolutely right. My my feeling was that too that because this was a studio film, 
you had I didn't I don't know who did the production design. I didn't go that deep. But you I think you had they they had a half Chinese, half American crew. And a, and I read this on IMDb. And and often if the, the Chinese, because of language barriers, screwed up in some way, they would just leave the set because they didn't want they had the same face. They couldn't they couldn't face the, the production crew because they had screwed up. So anyway, wow. I'm just saying that the production designers, the art director could perhaps have been uh, uh, from the studio. And, you know, we need dragons. We need girls. We need compliant servants. We, I worked on the Chan movies years ago. This is what they like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I'm but I, I, I think your, your explanation is, is legit because why not? You know, these are the Americans coming in. This is more... This scene has been discussed more in the history of cinema discussion right now. I'll I'll put that up to anybody who has discussed it before. But you know that's that's what two I... different theories, two different theories. How about that? That's great. Right. <laughs> but that's you know I'm I'm fascinated by <laughs> these kinds of conversations because as we kind of mentioned yes. the whole like politically correct stuff or whatever. Yes. I think people make a lot of assumptions nowadays about the intent of, you know, people. Oh, everybody was racist so long ago. Yes, it was a problem, <laughs> but it's also that they didn't know as much or necessarily have as much access to right. the stuff that we do today. It's kind of like saying, why, yeah. why didn't, why didn't uh, Alexander Graham Bell just use his, you know, his iPhone? I'm like, well, because, you know, <laughs> <around>, you know. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know. Mr. Watson, I'm canceling you. <laughs> via text that could have been no. the first line <laughs> <laughs> yes um okay uh, so. let's, let's see what i got uh oh the apple trick what was that about did you figure that out where where a woman would throw up an apple han would throw in like a sharp object and then the apple would fall into the hands of the person who yeah. was intended it for so did you figure out what that was about? I, I was like, are they getting a fight invitation? Are they get you know? I is it, is it and symbolic? I think I was I, I was so caught up in the act of what they were doing that I didn't really pay attention to what it meant. I thinking about it now right. because nothing really comes of it. I thought maybe because I thought that it was the girl who was throwing the darts or or maybe she was helping or something like that, that maybe she was going to become a big assassin or something like that. But it just seems to me like a parlor trick, like another like, hey, here's <laughs> here's how we eat apples on the island. You know, it's all it's you know cool and deadly and whatever. <laughs> it, it was very cinematic. I have to give it that. I was like, whoa, that's pretty cool. <laughs> well, how about the the damn was it the praying mantises wrestling each other on the oh boat? My God. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's hilarious, but it's also like, how did they do? <laughs> I, I the, said, suddenly it's a nature documentary. But it's great because you're watching these two insects actually. I mean, I'm sure what they did was they recorded two insects fighting. And then later, late on the story, like, oh, here he is going in for the kill. But damn it, I was riveted. <laughs> Well, apparently, and again, I found this on IMDb. Apparently, they they got these prey mantises from I don't know the insect farm at Universal Studios or Warner Brothers, or you know they had connections, the insects, and they brought them over and they wouldn't fight. So I assume I assume they just filmed it over at the studio and then cut it in, like you said, because it, it was almost thought... an awkward. Well, it was I an thought you were going to say cutaway. They were like, <laughs> I thought you were going to say that Bruce Lee was dissatisfied that they wouldn't fight, so he actually jumped into a praying mantis costume and then played both parts because he's that good. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So I, I wrote this down. What is your purpose in life? Only to die through the hands of a burly Asian man on a remote island. <laughs> <laughs> to going back to the henchman thing. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I said I also said there are martial arts stars and there is Bruce Lee. And that's it. 
He's in a category all by himself, man. I mean, you finally, <clears throat> to see, to appreciate the talent and the intensity of this guy uh, through his ultimate movie was a real pleasure. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad we watched this and got to talk about it as well. Um, it's it kind of makes me sad. I mean, there there are other you know bits of Bruce Lee, you know, film and and TV that I could go back and watch. I'm sure, but right. I, I was thinking about this like, what would he be doing today? Because it's 50 years. I mean, he would have been in right. his early 80s. But I mean, you've got action stars now who are still kicking ass and making movies. Jeez. It just makes me wonder what he. Can you imagine Bruce Lee in Expendables Four? Jesus. <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Uh, one thing I wanted to say, uh, there there was, and this goes back to my days watching those Chop Saki films on UHF, the sound effects within those were always hilarious, and we've probably seen them satirized in other films, but they kept them pretty much intact in this. There is a lot, uh, uh, ah, e. Oh, and every punch is a, right, yeah. every punch is the like, <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It was so, so funny. Good. I was like, they couldn't, they couldn't help themselves. Now, I also read that the film was uh, shot without sound. They did have mics up there, but they 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 looped in everything afterwards, except for a few key scenes. So that's very Which, interesting. So the, so the you know the sound effects guy got his turn, <laughs> as they say. Right, and you see that with a lot of you know movies. I mean, I'm doing a whole years long series on giallo films i know that's that's italy but it's uh, you know very common um in this era and i think it i honestly didn't notice after a while like the first time you hear bruce lee speak you're like uh, yeah that sounds like that sounds very much recording booth but you know as the movie goes on right. you get invested in the characters right that's one of the things that well, there's stands not a lot out of this dialogue. movie there, there's not but there is so much investment in character in this movie or at the very least personality that we're missed mm -hmm. that we miss from a lot of modern action films i feel like this is the template and the xeroxes have gotten fainter and fainter and fainter as the as the decades have gone on yeah it's funny that's a good way of putting it and uh yeah i mean you realize how much is owed to this film not only from an, a, a, an action film standpoint but by a film economic standpoint. We're talking about a film made for, in those days, 850, making 400 million, 20 times its value. This was before Star Wars hit the scene in 77. So I think the whole industry kind of looked up and took notice and said, okay, how do we, you know, not only did it precipitate the Kung Fu craze in the US, but I think it also precipitated a different way to look at the economics of film, where Star Wars, once that came along, completely uh, took that to another uh, map level. So um, just an interesting cultural touchstone, a touchstone that if you're a cinema fan, you must partake of and to get an idea of the roots of uh, where we're at today. Very well said. And I would say that, you know, it is the 50th anniversary. So, I mean, I haven't heard about this, but I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, there's like a Fathom event or or some big screen, yeah. you know, limited release. Oh, absolutely. I will go if there's, if this comes to Chicago or somewhere near, I will go see this on the big screen because it is out, outside even the fighting stuff. It's just a beautiful big right. screen classic picture. Well, interestingly enough, too, uh, I suggested it to Sophia Wong Boshio of the Asian Pop-Up Cinema. And uh, I've, I've had a long association with her, so I know when she's just playing me. <laughs> <laughs> she definitely was playing me on this. But I was saying, you got, I said, Betty Chung, who played Mei Ling, a, a, probably the most significant woman role except for the the sec, you know, the the blonde secretary of Han, uh, so, excuse me, blonde assistant executive to Han. <laughs> um, she was also a pop star. I'm like, Sophia, 50th anniversary, 
you show the big screen version of this. You have Betty Chung to talk about the film. It would be incredible. And she dismissed me. <laughs> I know when she is, so it's okay. And when she Just, watches this, she'll know what she's talking about. <laughs> well, yeah, but here, here's the rub, Pat. You watch. That's going to be the highlight event of the next Asian pop-up cinema. <laughs> She, well, I she's gonna take I, your idea. Hey, like, I would love it as, <laughs> as long as I get to do the Q and A of Betty Chung. I'm in. There you go. <laughs> so I'm hey, putting we, that out there to the universe right now. We talked about she leverage earlier. Pop- this is your leverage, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All, All right. right. Anything else? I think we're good. I I'm glad that we yeah. talked about this. I'm glad I watched it. Oh um, man, yeah. If you haven't seen, Enter I can't the Dragon, imagine my it. film. I can't imagine my film history without this. That's how good I. And I agree. If they do a big screen, I'll be right next to you in that seat because I, I really do want to see this on the big screen. And, yeah. and really give it a, a good look. It is, I guess, a testament. If this means anything coming from me. When I was halfway through watching Enter the Dragon, I said to my wife, this is one of my new all-time favorite films. And I don't say that lightly, but it's it's just one of those things that kind of changed my life in a strange way. Just watching it last night on my TV, I'm like, where has this been all my life? Or where have I been for it? (laughs) Well, that's how I felt too at the end. I have to say, well, how did I leave this out of my canon? That's what my first thought was. Because I said, this is the source of everything. Uh, you know, it just cannot be denied. So Yeah. Well, I can't deny that I've had a blast talking with you as always. <laughs> it was. Uh, always Pat, good. The Uber critic McDonald of, what, what, where do you want to plug, <laughs> sir? What, what do you have going on that people can find you or, or what do you want to promote? Right. Well, let's start with HollywoodChicago.com. That's the main site. You'll find all my reviews, interviews, bull, bullshit on it. And um, and then I, I'm also on a couple of broadcast outlets, WBGR, FM in Monroe, Wisconsin, and my base station, WSSR in Joliet. But now we're doing a three-station simulcast. So reaching more people, always reaching more people. Awesome. <laughs> All right. Thank oh, you. speaking of reaching, uh, Yo. there there was the cobra. I forgot to mention. I have to mention this. <laughs> At one point, when he takes the cobra out of the bag to like throw into the room with the henchman, he slaps the yeah. thing on the back of the head, and the the, the gills. Are, oh, the hell cobras have! But the side flap things pop out. <laughs> That's incredible. <laughs> well, I'm like, first, I'm not touching the snake. <laughs> I'm just not. And secondly, I'm not slapping the snake. Snake so. But I again in the IMDb the trivia section, apparently he got bit once when he slapped it. So good. That's on you, Bruce. Yeah. <laughs> maybe that helped, maybe that led to his brain swelling up. Who knows? I, I just that yeah, that just crossed my mind when you said that. I'm like, oh God, that's so dark. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, three major investigations of his death. It's so fascinating. Read his IMDb or excuse me, his wiki page. Just read the death section. You're just like, what? Because people were so fascinated by the fact that this superhero man could just fall off the face of the earth in like a second. And he's one of those guys that because he died young, he's forever Bruce Lee. Forever Bruce Lee. Yeah. All right. Well, all praise to you, Mr. Lee. Thank you for a wonderful film. If you're watching this on YouTube in the afterlife, I don't even know what the hell I'm talking about. Pat, we'll be back next month talking about something. Yes. But uh, thanks. We again. all know yet. Yeah. But I love this anniversary crawl. So it's it's been a good trip. So Yes, sir. All take right, care, take my care. friend. Blessings. Blessings.